push that again. There we go. Now it's coming. Okay. okay. Say rolling. Rolling? Yeah. Congratulations, you're a South Recordist. Woohoo! New job! This episode is going to be about twice as long as usual. I tried making a shorter cut and it seemed somehow dishonest and disrespectful, so I'm just going to let it run long. So enjoy. Amanda, where are we going? The Great Wall of Los Angeles. Um, it's supposedly this uh, giant mural that goes down left to continue on the edge of one of those uh, north, river culverts. It's similar to Mural Mile, but we've already pre-screened this one, and it looks like it'll be worth it. Do you remember anything about it? Nope. Here on Google. Wow, I typed in Great, and Wall of Los Angeles was the first thing that popped up in my search. Nice. I typed in Great Wall in my GPS, and the first thing that came up was the Great Wall of China. <laughs> like, yes, Jeebus, I would really appreciate directions driving to the Great Wall of China right now. Uh, so, the Great Wall of Los Angeles is a half mile long mural painted along the inside of the Tahunga Flood Control Channel and depicts the intercultural the history of LA and the state of California. Uh, it took over five years to complete, 600 gallons of paint, and 400 volunteers along with historians, ethnologists, and anthropologists. So, we're gonna go take a walk down that. Amanda is gonna see if she can find herself some Pokemon. So, what, what's your Pokemon thing today? Community day for Machop. 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 Machop, I think. The history of California is the longest mural in the world, stretching 2,754 feet and depicting California's multicultural history. The project was supervised by Judith Baca for the Social and Public Art Resource Center, or SPARC, with each 100-foot section designed by a different artist. Initially painted between 1976 and 1983, restoration work was done in 2011. By 1980, it had earned the nickname, The Great Wall of Los Angeles. The timeline begins in 20,000 BC with a panel designed by Christy Lucas, featuring animals whose fossil records were found in the La Brea Tar Pits. By 10,000 BC, the area had been settled by the Chumash people. The Chumash had a close relationship to the wildlife, forming the transition to the second panel, depicting a Chumash village circa 1000 BC and a Chumash religious vision of humans and animal spirits mingling. This panel was designed by Christina Schlesinger and painted by Chumash volunteers who share this religious view. The panel ends with a white hand rising from the water, representing the destruction of the Native American life by Spanish settlers. What are you guys eating? What are you eating? The third panel, designed by Judith Baca, depicts the arrival of Spanish explorer Portillo, who led the first expedition from Mexico to Los Angeles in 1769. Off the bow of his ship, the figure of legendary black Amazon queen Calafia appears in the smoke. Portillo had expected to find Calafia on his journey, hence naming the territory California. The panel also shows the arrival of Father Junipero Serra, founder of the San Fernando Mission, known to the native people as the House of Death due to their population being decimated within a year by diseases brought by Serra and his men. The panel concludes with the founding of Los Angeles by a multicultural group of settlers, setting the record straight over the pervading myth that LA was founded solely by the Spanish. The fourth segment, designed by Judith Hernandez, shows California under Mexican governance. Dominated by Spanish land barons, indigenous labor was taken to build their haciendas. The panel begins with soldiers raising the Spanish flag and ends with the United States Cavalry battling the Mexican army for control of California. Artist Ulysses Jenkins provides a black American perspective on the gold rush, beginning with the discovery at Sutter's Mill which led to the mass westward migration of culturally diverse 49ers by ship. Pictured above the bay are Mifflin Gibbs, the first black newspaper magnate, and Mary Ellen Pleasant, a civil rights activist who defended fugitive slave cases. To the right is William A. Leisdorf, pilot of the first steamboat to reach San Francisco and later vice consul to Mexico. Meanwhile, migrants from the American South were busy getting laws passed to limit gold claims to whites only, barring the many black, Mexican, and Chinese 49ers from benefiting from the gold rush. Other figures depicted are Biddy Mason, an ex-slave who became wealthy and founded the African Methodist Church, Joaquin Murrieta, the legendary Mexican Robin Hood, 
and a representation of the Native Americans slaughtered to make way for the railroads. The Iron Horse transitions into the sixth panel, Gary Takamoto's Sojourners, showing the wave of Chinese immigration to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. This in turn led to a surge of racism against Asians, culminating in the hanging of 11 Chinese workers by vigilantes in 1871. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ceded Upper California to the United States, bringing a boom of new settlement and development to the West and the beginnings of the California citrus industry. At the same time, the women's suffrage movement came to California to begin their work here, as depicted in this segment designed by Olga Muniz. The eighth panel, From the Mountains to the Shore, was designed by Native American artist Charlie Brown and depicts turn-of-the-century Los Angeles, including the convenient red car public transportation system, typical city life, and San Pedro Harbor, which at the time was widely populated by flying fish. The ninth and final panel of the original 1976 work features artist Isabel Castro's homage to the next wave of immigrants, who were instrumental in the development of the region, waving the flags of their varied origins. The painting sets the stage for the 20th century by showcasing the inventions of the airplane and the automobile. Baca described the first round of art as, quote, a loosely connected series of easel paintings, and sought to introduce a greater standard of continuity into the successive works. For the 1978 installment, she took greater control over the artistic composition of the piece, bringing more complex transitions and more stylistic unity to the project. 1978's first panel depicts World War I with an emphasis on women's roles in the conflict. As the Doughboys leave, kissing their ladies goodbye, a shortage of men in the country left many traditionally male roles at home empty. With the mythical symbol of liberty encouraging them to take up the sword of justice, many women entered the war industry, filling welding positions as easily as nursing. Famous silent film comedian Charlie Chaplin appears in the piece. Chaplin was representative of the common man at the time, and his presence bridges the war effort with the burgeoning film industry in California, segueing neatly into the next panel. Thomas Elva Edison, famed businessman and supposed inventor of light bulbs and film cameras, among other things, is given a generous portion of wall for his visage. Edison's Mexican heritage is represented by the presence of the Chichimeca corn goddess, whispering secrets of ancient inventors and builders into his ear. This panel leaves us with an image of the cast of The Great Train Robbery, one of America's earliest narrative films, and early Western movie star William S. Hart. Only these two panels were completed in 1978. Oh. Kind of hurts my arm to hold it like this. <laughs> Are you enjoying the mural or just the mural? I've been going to the mural. It's beautiful. How's your coat coming along? Not as good as I would hope. I haven't cut a single shiny on my primary cap. The 1980 project featured increasingly complex designs and transitions, bringing the mural international attention. The mural's 12th panel, Illusion of Prosperity, shows gangsters of the 1920s using illegal alcohol to get rich during Prohibition, while a flapper dances. This is the titular Illusion. Meanwhile, black jazz musicians face discrimination, segregated from their audiences and banned from hotels while on tour, with only the now legendary Dunbar Hotel allowing them quarter. Then the market crash came, and with it, the horrors of the Great Depression. Despite the newfound efficiency of assembly lines and a rosy facade put up by Hollywood, the reality of the era could not be covered up. Massive unemployment, cruel labor practices, bread lines, and alarmingly low wages for the employed finally led to widespread strikes and a strong union movement. Meanwhile, unfair and invalid treaties were being enforced against native populations, forcing them to sell off their land to developers for as little as 45 cents an acre. Hundreds of thousands of Mexican Americans were rounded up and deported. Meanwhile, the Dust Bowl ravaged the Great Plains, displacing many poor farmers to the West Coast, bringing a new influx of easily exploited cheap farm labor to California. While these Okies came to California willingly, another group, the Nisei, were being forcibly relocated to Japanese internment camps due to mass anti-Japanese sentiment arising from the Pearl Harbor attack. The fourth section of the wall was completed in 1981, this time designed jointly by Judith Baca and Jan Cook. It picks up exactly where the last segment left off. World War II. The panel honors the 442nd Infantry, a regiment composed almost entirely of Nisei, second-generation Japanese Americans. This piece deliberately calls attention to the contradictions of the time. While the 442nd is shown coming out of the American flag, below them their countrymen are forced to move backwards into the internment camps of the previous panel, losing all that they have on the way. The painting then moves to Jewish Americans, listening intently to the radio for news from Europe, while in the shadow of Hitler's hand. From Hitler's fist issue armies of Nazi soldiers, marching toward an Antifa rally in Los Angeles, and beyond that, into the war. 
The Pearl Harbor attack is shown above, and Jeanette Rankin below. Rankin was the first woman ever elected to Congress, representing Montana in the House, and was a passionate pacifist and women's suffrage activist. She introduced the legislation which would become the 19th Amendment into Congress, and holds the distinctions of being the only woman allowed to vote on giving women the right to vote, and also the only congressperson to vote against entering both world wars. Rankin later retired in California and died in Carmel in 1973. She was a Republican. Amid the war is the building of the California Aqueduct, which was meant to transport northern water to the southern end of the state to aid developers, and ended up creating a desert out of the Owens Valley. As we are still in the 1940s, though, we are not done with World War II. The next section shows a group of generals and businessmen at the top planning the war effort, with the streams of soldiers, arms, and factory women instrumental to the conflict depicted below. To the right of that, the mural calls special attention to the black women enlisted to support the war. This segues into a portrait of Dr. Charles Drew, a prominent surgeon and a pioneer in the field of blood transfusion. Drew's major accomplishments included improving blood storage techniques and developing large-scale blood banks during World War II, practices which are estimated to have saved the lives of thousands of Allied soldiers. Drew was killed in a car accident in Alabama in 1950. The mural depicts him cradling himself in his own arms as he dies, after being ironically denied a life-saving blood transfusion due to the hospital having no available, quote, Negro beds. This has been a popular story about Drew's death for decades, but unfortunately for this mural, it's not true. According to John Ford, one of the passengers in Drew's car, who was also black and also a doctor, Drew's injuries were so severe that nothing could be done. If I may editorialize for a moment, the story of Dr. Charles Drew is rife with racial discrimination and the challenges he faced because of it, and the great strides in desegregating the medical field that Drew himself had a strong hand in. Any of these stories would have been great subjects for the painting. It's unfortunate the artist chose to use a widespread and long debunked lie in a story where he has no age. Agency. On the other side of Dr. Drew, the same black women afforded a new opportunity in the war industry find they still have to fight housing discrimination. The sign, We Fight Fascism Abroad and at Home, is held by Texana Laws. Laws and her husband Henry had purchased a house in a white area of LA governed by housing covenants, which were clauses attached to housing deeds that prevented the property's sale to persons of specified races. The laws were sued for breaching the covenant. Private First Class David M. Gonzalez was a war hero from Pacoima, California, who was killed in action in 1945 at the age of 21. During the Battle of Luzon, five American soldiers were buried in their foxholes as a result of an Allied bombing run. Without hesitation, Gonzalez rushed into a hail of machine gun and sniper fire to dig his comrades out, saving the lives of all five soldiers, who were evacuated to safety. However, as soon as the third man was freed, Gonzalez was hit and mortally wounded. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor by President Truman. This is deliberately juxtaposed with a panel depicting the Zoot Suit riots to show the contradictory treatment of Mexican Americans at home. From June 3rd to 8th, 1943, American servicemen were brought into Los Angeles by local police and given carte blanche to attack, strip, and beat young Mexican-American men wearing zoot suits, which were popular among the demographic. Who's that whispering in the trees? It's two cities and they're only... Ostensibly, the source of the conflict was the large amounts of fabric used for the suits during a time when resources were rationed due to the war. But that reasoning is exactly as flimsy as it sounds. Tensions over the Sleepy Lagoon murder are considered a lead-up to the riots. The perseverance of the zoot suitors through the four became inspirational for Chicanos during the Chicano movement. Segwaying through the Sleepy Lagoon murder, Luisa Moreno was a prominent social activist and leader in the United States labor movement whose contributions to social progress cannot be adequately summarized in an essay as brisk as this one. She was a champion for Mexican civil rights and workers' rights as a whole, unionizing workers in multiple industries and multiple states and continuing to push for progress her entire life. She organized the Sleepy Lagoon Defense Committee to help exonerate 12 Mexican youths convicted in a murder case with little to no evidence. Moreno is represented here wrapped in the flag of the Congress of Hispanic Groups and placed next to an image of the Bracero Program, which contracted Mexican farm workers for temporary employment and brought them into LA from elsewhere. Moreno organized to secure these farmers more humane and fair working conditions. Parallel to the train bringing Braceros to LA is the St. Louis, a ship which carried Jewish European refugees from the Holocaust. The spirit of a suffering victim reaches helplessly for American soil. These refugees have been denied entry to the US because Jewish immigration quotas had already been met. Behind this specter is a haunting image of the Nazi death camps and the atomic bomb, and beyond that, the founding of Israel and the greening of the desert. The end of the war brought about a surge in prosperity for the middle class, including tract homes and the baby boom. Just look at that boomer. Just. Just look at it. Boom. But through the window, returning soldiers of color look on at a dream that has not been made accessible to them. Little had changed. Ugh, Reagan. The fifth and so far final painting session took place in 1983 and was once again directed solely by Judith Baca. 
The first piece in this section is titled Farewell to Rosie the Riveter. As the men returned from the war and resumed their positions as head of household, the empowered women who went to work to support the soldiers were forced back into the kitchen. The mural symbolizes this with a working woman being sucked into a vacuum ad on a television, relegating her previously found freedom back into the realm of fantasy. Behind the TV is the 1950s idealization of a middle-class white family, complete with their 2.5 kids, the .5 visualized as Howdy Doody. Rows of identical houses are depicted with moving vans leading to them, representing the mass migration of white Americans to the suburbs, as poor immigrants and people of color were pushed to the inner city. As the suburbs sprawl through the LA basin, the orange groves are uprooted. From there, we enter Joseph McCarthy and the Red Scare. The film industry was a favorite target of McCarthy, shown here holding a representation of the infamous Blacklist, as he dismantled so-called communist Hollywood. The Hollywood Ten, a group of producers, directors, writers, and actors specifically singled out by McCarthy, are found in contempt of Congress for refusing to answer McCarthy's charges. Their professional and personal lives were nearly ruined. The typewriter, seen here tied up by the Blacklist, represents the fear of being blacklisted instilled in Hollywood and the repression that carried, causing most to fear the repercussions of exercising their freedom of speech or offering social criticism. Sputnik hovers in the background, reminding us that this is all happening because McCarthy is afraid of the Soviet Union's technological progress. As the freeway system expanded through LA, minority communities were divided by highways seen here breaking through the roofs of their homes. Dodger Stadium is envisioned as a UFO descending from the sky into the Chavez Ravine, as a bulldozer and a policeman forcibly removed the resistant Chicano communities so the stadium can occupy land previously designated for public housing. I was saying it'd be nice if they had like plaques up explaining what each picture was depicting instead of just like a couple words underneath like with a person's name that nobody knows who they are unless you probably know a lot of history and then there's this plaque I don't know if it's talking about it doesn't match anything up there so I don't even know what it's talking about the 50s also brought the birth of rock and roll Elvis Presley is shown here hogging the spotlight from Chuck Berry and muscling in on the silver screen as well. Behind the screen are black musicians Charlie Parker and Big Mama Thornton, the latter of whom wrote Hound Dog, which Elvis popularized without crediting her. After the musicians, a representation of a Charles White portrait shows a black woman holding up South Los Angeles, a not-so-subtle portrayal of the sustained activism of black women literally holding up their communities. This scene merges with the next, showing the rise of the civil rights movement and prominent leaders Paul Robeson, Rosa Parks, Gwendolyn Brooks, Ralph Bunch, and Martin Luther King Jr. While the civil rights movement was finally gaining real traction, the gay rights movement was just emerging. Through the window of the bus, we see the police symbolically entering the closet to suppress these voices, while in the kitchen, women form the first known lesbian rights organization in America, the Daughters of Belitis, and duplicate copies of their newsletter, The Ladder. Meanwhile, in a bar, solitary men perform traditional masculinity while seeing a reflection of what they wish they could be in a mirror. They each wear a mask on the back of their heads, representing the Mattachin Society, the first group to advocate social equality for homosexuals. A small panel depicts Allen Ginsberg, himself a gay man of Jewish descent, representing the Beat Generation. The Beats were another group that was harassed by the rigid establishment of the day, speaking out for freedom of expression and creating art, music, and poetry that often came under fire in court for obscenity. From Ginsberg, we transition to a piece titled Jewish Achievements in Arts and Science, a collage which highlights the high-risk business activities of Jewish Angelinos in the 1950s. These entrepreneurs became the backbone of the garments industry. Jewish Americans had also built film studios in LA starting in the 20s, which by the 50s had developed into highly successful enterprises. But the majority of this panel is dominated by the visage of Albert Einstein, holding a diagram of an atom, representing his concern that atomic power should be used for peaceful purposes, not war. Over Einstein's shoulder is a panel called Indian Assimilation, chronicling the US government's efforts in the 1950s to force Native Americans into an Anglo lifestyle. The Native youth were stripped of their traditional dress, given haircuts, and shipped off to boarding schools several states away. Concurrently, the Asian community was making their own progress on integrating into American culture by choice. Despite harsh immigration quotas, Asian Americans attained naturalization in record numbers and gained the right to own land. This is represented in the painting by a Korean man being ceremonially granted American citizenship, while behind him a Japanese farmer proudly surveys his newly purchased field. The final panel of the Great Wall of Los Angeles, as it stands today, focuses on Olympic champions breaking barriers, 1946 to 1964. The smoke from the Olympic torch encircles four athletes 
athletes who overcame incredible obstacles to realize their dreams. Vicky Manalo Droves, a Filipina diver, Sammy Lee, a Korean diver, Wilma Rudolph, a black runner who required leg braces as a child and could not walk until she was eight but became the first American to ever win three Olympic gold medals, and Billy Mills, an Oglala Lakota marathon runner who challenged repression in boarding schools and became a symbol of Native American pride. The final runner symbolically carries the torch of the civil rights movement from the 1950s into the 1960s. This is where the mural ends for now, half a mile from its starting point. Though no new panels have been added since 1983, it's still considered a work in progress. Spark, still led by Judith Baca, has plans to continue the story of Los Angeles, picking up in the 1960s and expanding the mural to a full mile. I got exactly what I wanted out of today. Shiny Pokemon. I got caught a 100% perfect IV shiny Machop. All right, so Great Wall of Los Angeles. Take I it liked it. 21. It was definitely better than Mural Mile. I just wish there had been more historical information. In a mile, turn right onto Balboa Boulevard. There was just pictures, and then there'd be like a random person's name under there and some of them you re could recognize as historical figures but some of them at least i did not so we went to public school in america who knows what kind of historical education we actually have we also went to public school in wisconsin we got our state's yeah. history and probably important things happened in our state yeah which i'm sure they probably learned in california important things happening in their state in the past also, some of the mural was like, it seemed to be like a timeline, but then suddenly it would jump back like 20 years and then jump forward like 50 years and then jump back again. And I don't know. Well, at least we had a nice walk. Yeah. Copper's happy you got to come with us. Yep, yes he did. I honestly don't know what kind of video this is gonna end up being. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a hiking video like our other adventures. So, <laughs> I absolutely do not know how I'm going to make this video work. It's in remarkably good shape. Like, I had actually thought, because Amanda and I have been, have come down here once before to check it out. And I thought it was like a newer thing, a more recent uh, thing. But like, if you look at the dates on all the, the different parts, like, no, they did this in the 70s and early 80s. And, uh, it still held together that well. It looks like there was a restoration done in 2011, but I mean, even that's 10 years ago now. Oh so. my god. <laughs> it was an enjoyable walk. It was a pleasant day to be outside. It was a pleasant day to be outside. That it, it was. was. January, and we were out in shorts, tank tops. And we are loving the sunny, balmy weather. I was out in a sundress. I got a little hot. My brain was getting baked in the sun. It was 90 degrees today. <laughs> Street. 